Um, good evening again, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Thank you so much for your patience, but we promise this event will be worth it. Um, my name is Katie Dolan. I'm the chair of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. And just a few administrative announcements before we start. Um, so first of all, the exit is located behind you on the JFK street side, so in the event of an emergency, you can just walk to that exit and congregate in the JFK park. Um, please take a moment now to silence your cell phones, but you can join the conversation tonight with us online by tweeting with the hashtag New Frontiers. We're now going to open the event with a brief video. Never before has man had such capacity to control his own environment, to end thirst and hunger, to conquer poverty and disease, to banish illiteracy and massive human misery. We have the power to make this the best generation of mankind in the history of the world. Um, so please join me in welcoming tonight's guests and the acting director of the Institute of Politics, Congressman Bill Delahun. Well, thank you. And, uh, Again, thank you for your patience, but the good congressman had work to do down in Washington, D.C., but we're glad he's here. Um, I am Bill Dullahan, and I am the acting, underscore acting director of the Institute of Politics. So on behalf of those, uh, of everyone here at the IOP and at the Kennedy School and Harvard University, I thank you for joining us. Uh, I am most pleased to welcome the, to you to the 2017 John F. Kennedy New Frontier Awards and to extend hearty, con hearty and heartfelt congratulations to this year's uh, recipients, Congressman Carlos Cubello and May Boise. Did I pronounce that right? I have to say something very, uh, this is very personal, but I, I just discovered that, that May is a graduate of one of the finest uh, institutions of higher learning in this country, Middlebury College, where I graduated a few years before May. <laughs> but she certainly makes uh, those of us uh, alumni very proud for her work there. Uh, well, first, uh, let me uh, acknowledge the New Frontiers Committee co-chair, I'm looking for him, Steve Rosting, uh, the executive director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, our partner in the New Frontier Awards. Steve and his team are doing incredible work at the foundation, including an extraordinary year-long centennial celebration of what would have been President Kennedy's 100th birthday. Believe me, uh, it's a must-see. Uh, I remember uh, going through that, that exhibit and being moved because I never would have considered elective office or public service if it hadn't been for President Kennedy. He motivated me and many of my generation, uh, and it brought back wonderful, warm memories of a very special time in American history. Of course, I was Irish, so I could really identify uh, with President Kennedy. Um, Steve's commitment to public service spans the in his entire professional life. It's a pleasure to work with him and the foundation team. And Steve, would you please stand up? <laughs> and of course, my gratitude as well uh, to the IOP staff. They're fantastic. Uh, and the students. Uh, volunteers who make all of this possible. So give them a round of applause as well. Uh, 
A distinguished bipartisan uh, committee of political and community leaders selected May and Carlos to receive this year's awards. I want to ask uh, all of the members of the new Frontier Awards Committee to stand up. You're here. Thank you for great work. I want to say something about a very special member of that committee. Uh, he's an icon to me, uh, and he's an icon in the Kennedy world, and his name is Dan uh, Fenn, for whom one of today's awards uh, is named after. Uh, the, the award for public service. Uh, and he, unfortunately, he cannot join us tonight uh, but his daughter, Ann Fenn, I understand is here. Ann, would you please stand up? <laughs> now the IOP and the Kennedy Library Foundation joined years ago to create the New Frontier Awards to celebrate those outstanding young Americans who embodied the spirit of public service that was so eloquently stated by President Kennedy. Uh, the two people that we honor tonight embody the values that President Kennedy hoped would animate people towards public service. Uh, optimism, innovation, uh, and perseverance. I, it's clear that the two recipients tonight uh, embrace those particular values, and you'll hear from them. Now, there's another young American who embodies these values as well, and that's President Kennedy's grandson, Jack Sloshberg. He is a passionate advocate for public service and also for climate action. He's worked as a staff assistant in the State Department's Bureau of Oceans and, Environment and International Environmental and Sci Scientific Affairs. But he's not afraid of getting his hands dirty either. He, is an he was an environmental technician at Clean Harbors here in Boston. So he did get his hands dirty, I'm sure. Um, he serves with distinction on the committee and also on the Profile in Courage Award Committee. He's currently in his first year at Harvard Law School. I know they're keeping him very busy up there as he has uh, discussed with me. So we're thrilled that he's here to be able tonight to present the new, the 2017 Frontier Awards uh, to our recipients. So please welcome Jack Slosberg. <laughs> Go get him, Jack. Thank you, Congressman, for that introduction. Thank you, Stephen, for being here. And thank you to all the members of the new Frontier Award Committee that I serve with and for finally listening to me for the first time this year. Um, and thank you to my law school classmates who I see here tonight. Um, getting you to leave the library is no small task. This is perhaps my proudest achievement, um, but I'll see you there later tonight and tomorrow and every single day for the next three years. Um, the New Frontier Award honors elected officials and private citizens under 40 years old, celebrating young leadership at a university filled with young people who want to make the world better that's run by older people who give us homework instead. <laughs> the New Frontier was President Kennedy's vision for America. It was, as he said, not a set of promises, but a set of challenges. Not what he intended to offer the American people as president, but what he would ask them. It was a call to action offered by the youngest man ever elected president. It harnessed the energy and faith and devotion of a young candidate and the new generation that he represented. It appealed in 1960, as it does today, to the young at heart, regardless of age, to all those who ask what they can do for our country. 
Remembering the new frontier, we acknowledge the critical role that young people play in the success of our democracy. Meeting the challenges of the moment requires the new perspective, drive, and determination of young leadership. This is true for every issue that we confront today, but it is most apparent when you consider the greatest challenge facing the world, climate change. With climate change, the younger you are, the more urgent the problem seems, the greater the stakes are, and the more frustrating an action is. You don't need to be young to know that climate change is real and that it's already happening. You don't need to be young to know what the cause is, greenhouse gas emissions, or that we already have the solution, energy policy. But you do need the youthful energy and drive of the new frontier to believe that we are up to the task, to welcome the greatest challenge as the greatest opportunity for leadership and progress. That's what May Booby believes, and that's what she's been working on every single day. May is the executive director of 350.org, a global grass move, grassroots movement for responsible leadership in addressing climate change. The group was founded in 2008 by a handful of university students and environmental advocate Bill McKibben. And since its humble beginnings, 350.org has gone global. Their network extends to 188 countries, where they empower people to organize by providing advice, templates, materials to help mobilize anyone who feels the urgency of the issue to make sure their leaders feel the same way. May took over as executive director when she was just 27. And under her leadership, 350.org has had a profound impact. The organization played a central role in the success of the People's Climate March in, 20, in September 2014, where millions of people around the world gathered to demand action. I joined 300,000 other people in New York City that day, and I've never felt more hopeful or energized. 350.org also organized countless other demonstrations, and it was a critical player in mounting opposition to the Keystone XL and Dakota Access Pipelines. With an administration now in power which refuses to address climate change and pulled out of the Paris Agreement, May's work has never been more important than it is today. May Bouvi and 350.org demonstrate the power and necessity of motivated young leadership, and it is my honor to present the 2017 New Frontier Award to May Bouvi. Thank you so much, Jack, for being part of the climate movement, and thank you to the host committee. And I'm very honored and quite moved to be here. I feel particularly humbled because the 350.org staff, our network, and the entire climate movement are full of people who deserve an award like this. And I'm also very grateful that my family and many friends are in the audience. When I was in high school in Napa, California, we read 13 Days, the story of the Cuban Missile Crisis, written by Bobby Kennedy. And I've always loved the picture of President Kennedy and his advisors sitting in the White House around a table, seemingly at their wit's end, agonizing with the pressure of making the right decision. They look very human in that picture. Human in the sense that they are scared. They don't know what to do and they are relying on each other to do the best they can. The work I have been blessed to do with 350.org reminds me of this. It feels presumptuous to say something like that, but this is what I mean. The climate crisis is here today, right now. Last month, wildfires ripped through Napa, California. Earlier in this summer, a record hurricane destroyed an entire island nation, Dominica. It is currently driving a drought that is killing numerous people on the African subcontinent. Each of these disasters, wildfires, hurricanes, and drought, are scientifically linked to the impacts of climate change. Fossil fuels are the number one driver of the problem, but there are other causes too, like deforestation and land use. We know that if we continue on the course we are on, burning fossil fuels, otherwise known as coal, oil, and gas, for our energy, we will rewrite the history books and make the planet essentially unlivable. So in that sense, 
it is very, very scary. Nuclear war 13-day style scary. We and other climate activists are often accused of scaring people too much. My colleague and friend Bill McKibben is fond of describing himself as a professional bummer outer. <laughs> But we do it because we believe it is respectful when building a movement to tell people the truth. And just like in that photo, people are sitting around tables trying to make the, the right decisions to do something about it. They are sitting across from their legislators and asking for 100% renewable energy. They are sitting across the table from boards of trustees here at Harvard, calling on Harvard to divest its pension and its endowment from fossil fuels. And they are sitting together, building community while they do this. That is exactly how 350.org started. We were just seven people then, and we all fit around one folding table. We needed an office just that big for the table, the chairs, and our laptops. We set out to contact every single social justice and environmental organization on the entire planet and invite them to join us in a global day of protest about climate change and to form the number 350 at an iconic place in their community. Here in Boston, that happened, and out of it grew 350 Massachusetts. Today, they held an action calling on the governor to sign an executive order effectively banning fossil fuel infrastructure in Massachusetts. Since then, the global network has only grown. Right now, it's about 9 o'clock in the morning in Australia, and our 350 Australia colleagues are just starting their day, probably sitting around a table together. They are fighting the largest coal plant, excuse me, coal mine ever proposed in the world. It's called the Carmichael Mine. This project, if built, is one of 14 so-called carbon bombs. If built, they add up to six degrees of global temperature rise. We've already warmed the planet one degree, and you can see what's happened, so you can imagine what would happen if those projects went through. But fortunately, there are climate activists working to stop every single one of those projects and to defuse every single one of those carbon bombs. This movement is big, broad, and diverse. At its front lines are women, are people of color, leading in their communities and doing what they believe is needed to stop this existential threat. We have three goals at 350.org. To stop all new fossil fuel projects, to transition to 100% renewable energy, and to stop financing of fossil fuels. If we succeed, and the we here is very important, the we is much bigger than 350.org, it is a vast network of individuals, organizations, and movements working together, But if we succeed, we can actually halt the worst effects of climate change. And we believe this is possible because of all of these people trying to be human together, to not be afraid to look at the scary part of climate change, to really look at it and really understand it, and then to work at the scale and pace that is required. Because, and this is where I'll end, we can do that. Many people invoke President Kennedy's moonshot metaphor. There is a moonshot for climate change, too, and it also happens to be in outer space. <laughs> it is called the sun. Well, not just that, but solar power is a big part of the solution. And so is wind energy and energy conservation and sustainable lifestyles and forms of transportation and food systems that amount to changing our entire energy system and, in fact, our entire way of living. And the current version of way of living doesn't seem to be working so well for most people on this planet, where the eight richest people in the world own 50% of the world's wealth. So we have to transform the world, and we can do that through the clean energy transformation that the climate crisis is urging us to do. We can create and transform a world through clean energy that is localized, that creates jobs that are safer for workers, and that helps reconnect people in their communities, out of isolation and toward togetherness. It's all very possible. We have the tools and we have the movement. Thank you. Thank you, Mae. Um, accepting the nomination in 1960,
Then Senator Kennedy declared it was time for a new generation of leadership from those who were, quote, not blinded by the old fears and hates and rivalry, from those who can cast off the old slogans and delusions and suspicions. Climate change certainly demands that type of leadership, the kind that Congressman Carlos Corbello is providing us today. In 2014, at just 34 years old, Carlos Corbello was elected to represent Florida's 26th congressional district, and the young Republican incumbent won re-election again two years later. He is a man of his party, proudly so, but he's also a young congressman who refuses to follow dogma blindly. He broke with much of his party on climate change, acknowledging its urgency, advocating for effective policies, and using his elected office to build consensus. And just as May did as a private citizen, Congressman Curbelo identified the lack of political will as the primary obstacle in addressing the most important issue facing the world today. So he mounted a pragmatic and courageous effort in response, co-founding the House Climate Solutions Caucus, a bipartisan group that has grown to include 60 members, equal parts Democrat and Republican. Their mission is to demonstrate that there is, in fact, consensus on climate, to build more, and to show that members of both parties that they can acknowledge it without violating their principles or alienating their constituents. Congressman Corbello's work on climate demonstrates the impact that young leaders who dare to think differently and challenge tradition can have on our national politics. As a young man and a member of a new generation, one that expects more out of our politics, that believes we aren't as divided as we may seem, that welcomes climate change as an opportunity for American triumph. I'm grateful that Congressman Curbelo is representing us in Washington. And it is my honor to present the 2017 New Frontier Award to Congressman Carlos Curbelo. Let me begin by thanking the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation, the Kennedy School here at Harvard, and the Institute of Politics for hosting us this evening. I'm blessed to have my wife Cecilia here, as well as my parents, other family members and friends who made the trip. A big thank you to Jack. When uh, he called me, I told him I wasn't sure if I deserved this special recognition, but that I would accept it anyway. So thanks, thank you, Jack, and thanks to all the members of the, of the board. The truth is that I'm here tonight in representation of 61 other members of the U.S. House who have joined the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus with the goal of working collaboratively to address climate change. I especially want to mention my fellow co-chairman also from the great state of Florida, Congressman Ted Deutsch. Bipartisan cooperation is oftentimes frowned upon by the leadership of both parties and therefore Members who engage in this type of conduct anyway should be commended. I also salute organizations like Citizens Climate Lobby, the Environmental Defense Fund, the Nature Conservancy, and others whose members are sincerely committed and dedicated to building support for responsible environmental policies in both parties. We could not have gotten very far without them. And I also want to thank my longtime friend and chief of staff, Roy Schulteis, who began educating me on climate change and specifically sea level rise long before I started my service in Congress. Lastly, I'm grateful to so many South Floridians, many men and women I represent in Congress, who have taken up this cause and called for action in order to secure the future for rising generations. In accepting the New Frontier Award on behalf of all of them, I want to take a moment to note my deep admiration for the Kennedy family. In particular, I would like to take note of the extraordinary service of Ambassador Caroline Kennedy during her time in Japan, as well as to recognize the service of my friend and colleague, Joseph Kennedy III, who, by the way, is a key member of our morning workout group. <laughs> as I reflect on this honor, I'm reminded of how much President Kennedy did to open our nation to the pursuit of scientific knowledge. Perhaps this awareness of the centrality of scientific knowledge was best demonstrated by President Kennedy's commitment to the exploration of space. For me, my knowledge of climate change and confronting the reality of a sea that is rising is of critical importance as I serve my constituents. 
Like President Kennedy, we need to both know and act. We must take steps now, not tomorrow, to address the environmental challenges that lie before us. We live in very challenging times. Our nation is disunited in profound ways, whether measured by race, disparity, and economic opportunity, or the conflict of ideology. President Kennedy's unshakable faith in the goodness of America and in the importance of our founding principles inspires my service in the United States Congress. Like all of us, President Kennedy lived in a time that was often marked by crisis at home and abroad. He confronted those challenges in a way that should give all of us great confidence and hope. In fact, after the disappointment of the failed Bay of Pigs invasion in Cuba, President Kennedy delivered a moving speech in front of thousands of Cuban exiles at Miami's Orange Bowl. I know people who were there, and many will tell you today that had President Kennedy completed his term, Cubans would not have suffered nearly six decades of tyranny. President Kennedy reminds us of the importance of public service. At a time when there is too much cynicism and doubt about the value and importance of public service, and in particular, elected office, we do well to remember that for President Kennedy and for his brothers Robert and Edward, public service was a noble and virtuous calling. To serve the common good is essential to the effective working of our democracy. As we celebrate the centenary of the president's birth, we should remember that from the time of our founders, politics is meant to be the art of what is possible, not the measure of our differences. We should encourage each other to become more, not less involved in the affairs of our community and in the future of our nation. Thank you very much for this honor. So inspirational. Thank you for your leadership in so many ways. Also, Bill, speaking of inspiration, I have great respect for the work that you did both in Congress and now that I have the honor to work with you on a regular basis. Join me to thank Bill and all the team from IOP. <laughs> this is very much of a partnership and throughout the room there are several folks that I am humbled Humbled to work with every day from the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. Um, can you join me to thank them for everything that they've done and are doing? Thank you all. <laughs> Just as many of us, myself included, were inspired by the words of President Kennedy, it is clear, having read your bios, looked at your information, and hearing both of you tonight, that people have been and are following your leadership and are inspired by the work that each of you are doing, and we're, we're, we're honored to and humbled to recognize that even in a small way and congratulate both of you for all of your work. Thank you very much. <coughs> we also have many uh, family members from our two honorees, and so if you can just hold your applause for a second, but we have May's mother and stepfather, her fiance and their parents, and several of the congressmen's wife and family in life. So can you all stand and be recognized <laughs> collectively? All of you. <laughs> we know this work is <coughs> great as the two of them are. It does take a village, so thank all of you for your efforts. I'm now going to ask the two awardees and Jack to come back up for a group photo. And while we do that, the podium will be taken away. So if the two of you and Jack could come back up for a, a group photo. And I think uh, we're going to move this podium. Great. <laughs> Congressman, this is yours.
And while the awards will come back here, and Jack, thank you, and while Jack has his seat again, um, our two awardees are gonna join us for a conversation. And we think about environmental leadership. We literally said, who is the best person who can guide us in this conversation? Please have a seat. Uh, and it's Steve Kerwood. And Steve Kerwood is here from Living, the host of Living on Earth, the weekly environmental news program on more than 300 national public radio affiliates. He's been a journalist for, for 30 years from The Globe and CBS and NPR, Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, guest lecturer as well. But on a personal level, when I think about a complex problem, I go and turn on Living on Earth and listen to Steve Kerwood. So join me to welcome Steve. After their conversation, there'll be a reception that all of you are welcome. Yeah. Kerwood. We'll just get this to work somehow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that generous introduction, Steve, and congratulations. You guys are amazing, because this is a crisis. This is an amazing crisis. Just a personal note, um, Jack, I met your grandfather when I was a Boy Scout. They took us to this little thing, and I got to meet him, shake his hand. But what I learned, one of the things, I, I learned many things from your grandfather, but one of the things that I learned from that experience was the conventional wisdom was, He's Catholic, you know, he'll never get elected. And that taught me that when you hear conventional wisdoms that are negative and, well, frankly, dissing people, don't believe it. Go through it. So this business that, oh, well, the climate is just some sort of a plot by the hippie, commie, radical, Birkenstock-wearing <laughs> folks, don't believe it. And what's really exciting about tonight is Congressman you are uh, amazing for standing up um, and saying something on a bipartisan basis because I'm also old enough to uh, people in my family work with John Chafee who was a Republican. I live in New Hampshire where we actually have Republicans. And the genius of the fossil fuel industry who has demonized uh, talking about climate disruption, the genius of that program was to somehow make it a partisan thing. That uh, if you had an R next to your name, you couldn't really talk about this. So I'd like us to applaud him for standing up. I'm sure it's not easy at all. And May, of course, your connection to President Kennedy is that power of youth. And what uh, you and Bill and, and the group at Middlebury have been able to make, because I, I do remember when there was just like four, five, six of you and talking about this and, and grabbing the new technology, because this is an internet phenomenon, folks, you know, um, and that uh, you have put this together so that um, I just was, uh, was talking with one of the folks at, uh, at the uh, Conference of the Parties in Bonn today, and the alternative pavilion that uh, the NGOs and some folks with deep pockets put up is the popular place. So America is in it, and the, the, uh, that place is what has the vibe. And uh, when the officials came from the administration, they got booed and jeered for pushing especially coal uh, and nuclear. So you guys have really done something, and I suspect you have just begun. So. Um, Either one of you can take this question first. What's the next step? The next step is action. And uh, actually, in listening to May, I was thinking she's doing all this phenomenal work around the world trying to stop these major projects. And I thought to myself, she's got the, the easy part of this. I have to convince my Republican colleagues <laughs> that this is all real. So uh, I say that in jest, and I'm actually very grateful to, uh, to many Republicans who have stepped up. Just to give you a little perspective, when I arrived in the Congress in 2015, there were maybe two or three of us. Chris Gibson of New York was kind of really the only guy out there who was talking about climate change. And uh, today, we have 31 Republican members of the House on the record acknowledging this issue, not just acknowledging that it's real, and that's an important first step, but certainly not enough, but acknowledging that we in Congress have a role to play uh, to make this situation better. Uh, so I'm grateful to the 31 Republicans, but also to the 31 Democrats who have been willing to engage. A lot of times, 
the opposing party, depending on the issue, says, no, let's, let's let them leave them out in the dark. Let's, let's let them crash. These Democratic colleagues, led by Ted Deutsch, are saying, no, let's engage. Let's actually have a conversation, try to convince people. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we're on a good path. I, I tell people I think there are three phases to this caucus. Uh, number one was getting around the table, having a discussion, just acknowledging the issue. We've done that. Number two is blocking bad policy, and uh, this year it was actually historic. Uh, the caucus came together and uh, defeated uh, a couple uh, amendments filed by members of the majority uh, that uh, essentially uh, would have prevented, in one case, the Defense Department for taking into account uh, climate change, sea level rise, and, and planning for it. We came together and we defeated uh, that amendment, and uh, that caught a lot of attention. And I think the, the most important phase, which we're working toward as we continue growing, is to develop a proactive policy agenda, uh, policies that will promote clean energy, that will help us accelerate a transition that, to be honest, is already taking place, just not fast enough. And what's your dream? for it to come as soon as possible. <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting there. We're, we're having very good conversations. Uh, people are uh, growing in confidence. Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, shyness, we'll call it, in politics these days. Uh, to use a more gentle term, uh, everyone's concerned about their base. What's my base going to think? But a lot of these members who have come on, they've been out there, they've gotten good press, and no one's upset, because guess what? Most Americans understand this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been demagogued, but most Americans understand what this is and where we have to go. And again, we're just trying to accelerate that. And Congress is always, as Congressman Delahunt can tell you, a lagging indicator, unfortunately, <laughs> it's a, and that's generous. <laughs> so May, uh, what's next? Well, I am impatient, <laughs> um, but I also know that this, oh, hello, um, this is a room of heavy hitters. I'm looking around, those of you that I know, and moreover, those of you who I don't know, and I like to quote San Francisco politician Harvey Milk, who would start every speech by saying, I'm Harvey Milk, and I'm here to recruit you. So I'm here to recruit all of you to join the climate movement, and some of you are probably part of it already. But what I love about working on this issue is every single career or passion you have somehow can connect to climate change. If you are studying policy advocacy here at the Kennedy School, if you work in transportation policy, if you are an attorney who has a pro bono program, if you are a medical doctor who is trying to explain the impact on human health, there's a way to find a connection on climate change. And the way we've been able to build this movement is because everyone is finding that connection. So I would say what's next literally is tomorrow when each of you wake up, think about this issue in a different way and find a different thing that you can do that you didn't do today because you were here tonight and you heard about the urgency. So, uh, am I this one? I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't know I was supposed to break dance, Steve. I so perhaps it doesn't like the, uh, the circuit back here. So, all right, you say, hey, get, in, get engaged. Let's move things forward. What's one thing that could be done right now that would really make a huge difference? It's just a motion away for us to... Uh, engage America as a whole community. Let me put it this way. So we're in Boston, which could be underwater. In fact, right here at, the, at this building, the charts show that rising sea level is, is underwater pretty quick. Or there's New York, where you're from, Jack, or uh, Miami, or uh, Tampa. Uh, last time I looked, uh, Charleston, South Carolina is going to be in trouble. Philadelphia is on a river. Um, this is something that affects all of us um, in this country, and yet we seem to be stuck on finger pointing and inaction. So the reason I ask kind of what's the next, how, how do we, you have a crack um, in this, um, how do we take that 
how do we take that spirit forward? In terms of building more consensus and public support, I really think we need to present this as a local issue because it has a local impact on every community. It's very hard for a lot of people to appreciate the magnitude of this issue when just thinking about, well, what's it doing to global uh, temperatures and, uh, you know, a lot of places don't have hurricanes, so they don't really understand that. But if we show how it's having an impact in every community, in every state, in every country, that'll get people engaged. And by the way, that crowds out, pushes out a lot of the political demagoguery because the local issues are easy to understand. If there's a pothole, no one can deny that it's there, and everyone will generally agree that it has to be addressed somehow. Maybe they'll have a fight about who's the contractor, but it'll get done. And this is what we have to do with this issue. In my district, it's a little easier. I represent the Florida Keys, okay? So uh, I tell people most of my residents live uh, at sea level and near the sea. So uh, they, they know that the sea level is rising. They see the evidence. Local government in Monroe uh, is already planning. In uh, Miami Beach, uh, they've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in a pump system. Uh, to help uh, resiliency. A city of Miami just approved a bond referendum. $200 million of that is going to address uh, flooding related to sea level rise. So in Miami, this is very obvious, but perhaps in other more rural parts of the country, it's not, but the effects are there. Farmers, I'm sure May knows about this, are starting to see the impact of this change in climate uh, in their productivity. Uh, so. I think the key is to make the case in every community as to how uh, this is an issue that affects everyday life, or will soon. I agree with that, absolutely. And that's very much how our campaign is structured, is what can cities do, what can states do, while we have the problem in the White House? And I started laughing when you asked your question, because you said, well, what would be the simplest thing we could do to advance this issue? And I thought, we have a real problem in Washington, and his name is Donald Trump. Um, so just to invite that into the room. <laughs> well, but wait a second. If your friend Bill McKibben were here, he has famously said that we've had a bipartisan deal yes. to not deal with climate change. Yes, it's true, but it is a lot harder when you have a climate denier running the country. Yeah. I just didn't want to pretend like we were having this conversation last year. We're having it now, and one of the areas where the Trump administration has been very effective is in environmental deregulation. There's a, there's a story out there that they can't get anything done, but on this issue, they know exactly what they want to do, and they are doing it. So. I don't want to pretend like that's not a huge piece of the problem, and it has to go forward simultaneously with the local action. Um, it's not one or the other. Well, and I would say to that that the good news is that there's this new development in the Congress that didn't exist before a couple years ago, and th it wouldn't be the first time in our history where one of the branches leaves a vacuum of power or leadership on a particular issue, and the other branch uh, comes and fills in. I think that's the way it was designed to work. So. Uh, we're, I think, making great progress, and despite some of the statements and the actions, I do know, and I can confirm, that there are people in the administration that understand the issue and that are trying their best to have a positive influence. Well, how much can government do, though, at this stage of the game? You know, uh, if, if this is a following institution that you're a part of, that you really have to wait for consensus to go ahead, um, how much can actually be done by governments? Because I sort of wasn't kidding about the bipartisan thing. Um, the bone I would pick with the Obama administration is they didn't even bother to put together a playbook for Copenhagen. Right. They didn't even know what was going to happen there. You know, if you go to international negotiation, you're supposed to have a task force, you know, right. the State Department of Commerce and none of them. I mean, you get all the agencies together. They didn't even think about it. And the thing blows up because they didn't even think about it and they're going out the door. The other branch of government, as you talked about, the Supreme Court made the order regarding CO2 as a pollutant, and that decision was being implemented, and yet at the very last second, the Clean Power Plan is getting promulgated, and in fact, was still late in the whole appeal cycle. And so, uh, you know, right now, uh, Trump is trying to roll that back, as Guy Pruitt is trying to roll that back. I, and who knows where the Supreme Court is going to be on that. 
So um, how do we get government to be functional on this? Because so far the report card is, I don't know, someplace between an, a D minus and an F from my perspective. The bottom line is you need legislation. And we've taken some small steps. Actually, in our tax bill, I've fought hard to get uh, uh, special credits for renewable technologies that uh, have expired under existing law. We extended uh, solar tax credits, wind tax credits. Those are small wins. This is not going to solve the problem, but it certainly, I think, builds momentum and confidence and gets Congress in the habit of legislating in a positive way in this area. But ultimately, we need uh, a bill that gets signed into law that pushes us aggressively towards a clean energy future. And how do we get that? We need to continue building bipartisan support in the Congress. We know uh, whatever the case is going to be, we're going to need a majority of votes in the House and 60 in the Senate. So that's, that's what we're working on. What's your secret sauce for the bipartisan thing? You know, I think uh, the best idea we had was to implement the Noah's Ark rule. Does anyone know what that is? So you can only join the caucus if a member of the opposing party joins with you. And uh, not only is this nice because you have perfect bipartisan symmetry, but all the members do our work for us. They go out and find each other. We don't have to do it all the time. So. Uh, you've had some Republicans go out and find Democrats they're friendly with, and of course you've had a lot of Democrats, still today there are a lot of Democrats hunting for Republicans that they can convince to come on board, but it's, it's, uh, it's worked wonders. We're up to 62. Uh, we, we had 20 last Congress, so this is growing. This is growing. Okay, how do you get to 430? Or I'm well, sorry, 420. <coughs> well, I just, why, why, you know, it's 218. Why, why do we need 420? Don't, oh, don't give me extra work. Oh, okay, 218 <coughs> votes. The piece I would add is that we're not talking about an issue where it's balanced on both sides. There is an enormous amount of lobbying pressure being applied by the oil industry to confuse the debate. And so in order to meet what you said, how to get government to do its job, we have to find a way to get that money out of the political system. And the process we've engaged in is trying to at least make the point that the oil and coal and gas industry is not like any other industry. Their product is toxic. It is climate change. And so their stake in this game is different than a technology company lobbying for different types of regulatory reform for how you manufacture an iPhone. This is a, actually quite a different problem. And so that was how the fossil fuel divestment campaign got started, actually. It was to try to make the point that there should be no public approval, no moral authority granted to an industry that causes climate change. That was why an effort was made to get institutions to divest, to have to choose a side between solutions to climate change or the will of the oil industry. So I think we can't talk about government doing its job if we don't talk about the influence of corporations. And that's why I think it's interesting to be here at this event, taking the historical perspective, because at the time when President Kennedy was enacting a lot of these reforms, we didn't have the level of corporate control of government that we have now. It's been a huge shift. And my generation, this is all we know. Um, the textbook version of how you pass a bill is not the world that we live in. And it's particularly true on this issue of climate change. So how do we deal with this matter of wealth? Um, I think we're in grave danger around it. And if you look back to history, uh, in 1860, the value of slaves in the South was greater than the real estate. And only 4% of white people owned slaves in the South at that point. It's a plantation thing. So there was tremendous wealth concentrated in that system. And by 1865, 1866, that wealth had vanished. Right. It was gone. Fossil fuels, the amount of wealth that is concentrated in the fossil fuel business, not only are they... Uh, not only are they corporations are extremely wealthy, wide-ranging, worldwide corporations that I'm going to guess that many people in this room have equities in those, in those companies. It's tremendous wealth. What we're talking about in terms of dealing with climate disruption is 
eliminating the use of fossil fuels, which is a source of this tremendous wealth. It's like telling somebody who had a plantation in 1855 that, fine, you're going to walk away from this and you're not going to have a dime from all these slaves that you've developed over these years. So how do you get around that? This is, this is not easy. You, know, you saw how it ended in 1860, one, two, three, four, five. Didn't end very well. I don't think we can afford that kind of ending for the climate crisis. And yet the challenge is as great if not greater. In this case, we've enslaved nature rather than people. And people who are part of nature. Indeed. <laughs> so we have both going, right? Okay, that's, that's fair. So how do we do this? May, you're, you... Uh, well, I think it's the right analogy, frankly. Um, I think in terms of this question about wrecking the economy, which is the number one retort when we make this argument about divestment or about changing the energy system, there's plenty of people who are not climate activists by trade, but who are run the Bank of England or are Michael Bloomberg who will make the argument that actually the way around this problem is that we're losing money right now by not acting. And that, in fact, the transition off of fossil fuels is the way to avoid some of the worst economic impacts we're sleepwalking our way into. This whole idea of stranded asset risk and a carbon bubble, it's exactly what you were just describing. That is why people are stopping investing in coal, is because they realize at some point that is not going to be profitable and they should get out of it now. So it really depends on some of those factors, but I would end by saying it is a moral issue also. Um, the financial argument is compelling and it is changing the economy and that's important, but it's also wrong. <laughs> it's wrong to be causing this problem and people's lives are at stake and that's why the analogy is right, that enormous disruption was created, but it was the right cause at the right time, just like this is. Congressman? I think markets generally are the most efficient way to solve uh, the greatest challenges that we have. And the more information we get out there, the more public support we're going to build, the more people are going to start taking matters into their own hands, putting pressure on the political system, and we will get the results we want. Uh, but we have to drive that market, and we have to, uh, from a policy perspective, be honest about the cost of pollution and, and uh, the, the moral hazard that's involved. Uh, be transparent about that and then trust the American people, the American consumer and, and everyone in the world um, to move in the right direction, which they typically do. So that's, that's uh, the consensus we're trying to work toward in the Congress and we're not where I'd like to be, but I'll tell you we're a lot farther ahead than I thought we would be. And that of course was the, was the solution uh, for the North back in the days of slavery, they converted to a system of free labor and uh, paying people uh, instead of uh, owning them. So market solution, um, activist solution. Global revolution. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's now time for you folks to get engaged. You see some microphones here, and uh, why don't you hop into, the, hop into the discussion. If you choose to get up, please make it more of a question than a speech, but do identify who you are and where, you, where you're from. Okay, we seem to have a taker um, down here in front. Hi, um, congratulations to both of you. I'm Gina Coppola-Newfield from the National Sierra Club. Um, also a graduate of the Kennedy School, so very happy to be here. Um, so given that transportation has recently become the largest source of carbon emissions in this country, um, what are some of the transportu transportation solutions that you both are most excited about? Who wants to grab that one first? I can start. Okay. Yay, Sierra Club. <laughs> um, I would say electrification of the transportation system. And we're having a harder time coming up with alternatives to oil than we are with alternatives to coal. And so if we can electrify transportation, we can actually make it 100% renewable. And that's where a lot of cities are going. Actually, one of my 350 co-founders is at MIT studying sustainable transportation right now. Her name is Kelly Blinn. Um, 
And so I think it is a cutting edge part of the fight. And it's also very good economic policy. It's great for job creation. It, speaking of bipartisanship, it is actually a place where I think people can come together across difference. So that's, that's what I would say. And since you reminded me, uh, it's important for everyone in this room to know, speaking of oil, that on Monday, we're expecting a decision from the Nebraska Energy Board on the Keystone XL pipeline, which many of us have been fighting for a long time, and it could be uh, close to the end of that project's life cycle. So one of the challenges in fighting that fight is people saying, well, how are you going to run a car without oil? And so that's why we started paying more attention. Um, and there's also a great leader of the transportation movement in this room, Robin Chase. Robin, who's thinking about this all the time. So if you want to know more about this, talk to Robin. <laughs> so I agree, this is a, a big opportunity. Uh, this last campaign, I don't need to tell anyone how divisive it was, but one idea that both candidates seemed to agree on was uh, infrastructure and investing in America's infrastructure. Uh, it's very likely that uh, Congress will start looking in that direction just at the beginning of next year. And here we have a great opportunity to uh, invest in uh, new technologies that will help reduce the carbon footprint, encourage more mass transit. We certainly need that in Miami. Uh, Boston's a little better. Uh, but uh, I think there's a, a great opportunity uh, in the first quarter of next year to make some progress in that space in Congress. Uh, Congressman, I'd be remiss, though, to not point out that the, uh, the tax bill that the House just passed today has a provision that kills the electric vehicle uh, tax credit. Right, so tax reform, you really have to ask yourself a uh, central question. Do you want a, a flatter, fair tax system across the board, or do you want a tax system that's replete with myriad small provisions? So uh, I wouldn't interpret the decision to kind of clean up the tax code uh, as specifically targeting uh, any specific uh, sector. Uh, but I think uh, having said that, there's a very good chance that that uh, tax benefit gets reinserted into the bill later. Now, uh, we do need to see uh, this benefit flow uh, deeper into society because this is a credit that uh, to a large degree has been used by wealthier people and that's one of the reasons we have never been too excited about it because quite frankly, if you're buying a Tesla, you probably don't need any help from the government. Very happy for you, I can't afford it, but good for you, I don't need to subsidize uh, your Tesla. But as uh, lower cost vehicles uh, start becoming available, then I think it's far more valuable. Yeah, I mean, it's a 30K Chevy Bolt right now. Um, Okay, the next question, was there somebody up in the upper one there that I, oh, he stepped away. So that means that you're next, ma'am. I'm Robin Chase, and congratulations to both of you. What I like about both of you is this grassroots and top down and bottom up. And so if I think about this issue that you've raised about um, money in politics and the fact that most of Americans do care about addressing climate change, so my question to you is how do we restore democracy period, grassroots, and at the other end. Gee. You, you have all the big don't ideas. <laughs> I'm, I'm, don't, 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 everybody, don't everybody speak yeah, at once. Right. I think it's the right question. I mean, the corporate piece is part of it, but I think some of this has to do with, this is going to sound a little bit corny, but I think it's true, actually believing it's possible. Like, it's very easy to be cynical about money and politics. It's very easy to be cynical about lobbying influence, um, but to actually, you mentioned citizens' climate lobby, to actually still show up and engage with your legislators is part of how we do it. And I think that is one of the great power, powers of grassroots movements is that people can still do that. I mean, I walked into the governor's office today. Any of us could do that. And so uh, that's a lot of what our work is actually focused on is encouraging people to participate and especially people who know enough about politics to be justified in their cynicism, which is probably all of us. But if we're giving up on the system, then how do we expect other people to believe in it? <laughs> so I think that's actually quite important and 
I think we're living in a really interesting time with this resistance movement. So many people are becoming activated who we may not have been activated before. These indivisible chapters are springing up all over the country. There's tens of thousands of these chapters, and the results of the election uh, last week, there were tons of candidates who'd never run, um, who are, f you know, this is their first experience in politics, so we are seeing a shift if we know the right places to look. And I would also say this is not a problem unique to the United States. You know, the, the idea that democratic space is shrinking is a problem in many parts of the world where we operate. There's actually a pretty strong correlation between the countries with the most fossil fuels and the countries with the smallest amount of democratic space. Um, so it, it is a problem that is global in nature and requires global participation to solve it. But those are some, some thoughts that I have. So not in defense of our current campaign finance system, because I don't enjoy fundraising and I have to spend a lot of time doing it, but uh, assuming it doesn't change too much in, in the coming years due to the court's interpretation of the First Amendment, I'd say the good news is there are a lot of uh, wealthy people, big organizations uh, that are also starting uh, to invest in our political system and are making their voices heard. And that's important, and I saw that in, uh, in my race in uh, 2016. Environmental Defense Fund came in, other groups came in, and the environment was a big issue in my race. And the more uh, the environment becomes a major issue in races throughout the country, the better for this cause. So our campaign finance system is flawed, <laughs> but I have seen some improvement uh, under the current system. Um, of course, in this country, about half of the public votes, half of eligible voters vote, depends on where exactly, but so um, that's a question for our democracy. How can, how can it work if, if a majority of that half, in other words, you know, 25, 30 percent actually can control things if they get out, how do you get people engaged? One question. But Congressman, I want to first ask you, and this is a bit personal, but um, how do we get quality people like you to stand for public office, given, frankly, you talked about the finance issue, but there's, an, there's a high level of abuse of people who, who serve uh, in, in, in public office, uh, and we don't always get the best and the brightest. And we had Bill Delahunt here and, and such, but we don't always get the best and the brightest. We don't always get the Jack Kennedys who had to have other choices in life but choose to do public service. Um, what was it that caught you, caught your eye, thought that maybe you could really make a go of this, because I'm sure you had many other options that probably paid better, let you sleep at night, <laughs> um, and, and all that. How do we get people to really engage? Because if we don't participate in the democracy, it ain't going to be here for us. So th this question reminds me of John Boehner because he always says, I signed up for my homeowners association board and I ended up a speaker of the house. <laughs> and uh, I had always been into politics, but uh, I never thought I would run. And then uh, we had had our first daughter and a vacancy opened up on the school board. And a couple of people talked to me, and you know, I told my wife, what do you think? I said, yeah, it's only a two-year commitment if I'm miserable, it's just, just two years. So, But I had a wonderful experience there, and uh, I learned a lot, and I feel like I contributed a lot. And I'll tell you, in terms of our political system, broadly speaking, I have a lot of hope uh, for this rising generation, people younger than I am, people in their early 30s, mid-20s. I think this millennial generation comes with a refreshing approach to politics. Number one, they're not obsessed with political parties. We've become obsessed with parties in this country. Uh, it almost feels like a totalitarian state sometimes. You know, what party are you in? Uh, who are you voting for? It's like all these questions that I didn't remember hearing uh, when I was a kid. And this new generation comes in with a different approach. They just want to solve problems. They don't care who gets credit. Uh, they need to get more engaged, because a lot of them aren't. They're kind of in their own world. And, uh, but a lot of them uh, are just sober about uh, big issues. Sober but serious. Uh, a lot of millennials will talk to you about the sustainability of 
our entitlement programs and how they're worried, rightfully so, that these programs may not be around for them. I tell a lot of my Republican colleagues, now that I bring up entitlements and, and the debt, uh, this issue of the environment is very similar to the debt. Just because we ignore it doesn't mean it doesn't matter and that it, and that it won't uh, overwhelm us someday. So just like we have a, a financial debt in this country, a fiscal debt, we also have an environmental debt. And I think we need to start working urgently to address both of them. I think this new generation is going to make a big difference. The question is how long do we have to wait for them to rise to the occasion. So you're recruiting your friends? Oh yeah, I, I, I tell everyone to get in this. If I have to deal with it, they should have to deal with it too. Okay, <laughs> show of hands, who here is not gonna stand for public office having been inspired? <laughs> Come on, we need smart somebody. Smart people, smart people. All right, there's one back there, okay. We need another, I need another. We, we got another one here, okay. I need another, come on, I need another. Come on, all right. All right, those of you who have served in public office, you can raise your hands now, okay, all right. Good. All right. Well, there's some progress, but uh, how would you inspire them, May? To Are you going to run, May? I don't know. I like, <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like being on the outside, pushing in. I think that's an important part of the solution. But I'll tell a story of actually another Middlebury graduate named Greta Neubauer, who was very active in the fossil fuel divestment movement. And she's helped start an organization called the Student Divestment Movement, which helped all of the different students coordinate with each other, share lessons. And she just announced last week that she's running for office in her hometown in Wisconsin. And it's a tight district, um, but there's a lot of people like Greta in the climate movement who cut their teeth doing campus organizing and who are looking around for what how to make their mark, how to take their leadership to the next level, and this is what they're choosing to do. So that's one piece of it. But I think the reason she got engaged was because she understood that her sphere of influence, which was Middlebury, uh, that there was a place for her to be active there. And so whether or not you set your goal to run for office, some people are like that. Like I was, I was one of those student council types in high school. Um, I'm sort of surprised I didn't end up running for offices because I met these crazy kids at Middlebury. Um, but some people know that they want to do that and that's their life work, life's work, but other people get engaged because they care about something else and they find their way there. So I don't think you necessarily have to know right off the bat that that's where you want to go, but um, a, lot of, a lot of really amazing people like Greta are, are making that choice right now. No pressure on you, Jack, at all. <laughs> so which, uh, which one of you was first to stand? I, did was, I, I think you were? Yeah. yeah You're you were. so okay. honest. So we, have, uh, we only have time for two more questions, so this is perfect. Go ahead. My name please. is Mary Miller. I'm here tonight from Portland, Oregon, and I'm happy to be here. Um, climate change was right in our face this summer when the Columbia River Gorge was burnt to a crisp on both the Oregon and Washington sides, and uh, we couldn't leave our house for a couple of weeks inches of ash on all of our cars. I'm wondering, how can we instill a sense of urgency in Washington to make this policy, you know, environmental policies that you mentioned? I mean, I understand it has to become a major issue, but for us in the West, we don't really feel like we have time to wait for it to become a major issue before the West Coast becomes perfectly uninhabitable in the summertime. So what are the concrete things we can do besides calling our Congress people, besides walking in, um, becoming more engaged, as you mentioned, which I feel my generation's engaged, but it sounds like we need to do more to make that impression. So what can we do to really get this issue to the forefront as citizens? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I would go back to focusing on local issues. I think in the Pacific Northwest, there's a lot of uh, awareness and appreciation for how serious this is, but in other parts of the country there isn't. So perhaps you could do research about how this is a big issue in some parts of the South. You mentioned South Carolina. Uh, and try to raise awareness there. Uh, I would do my best to try to convince people as much as possible. I think the more we yell at each other, the more we try to shame each other, the more resistance we get from those who we're trying to influence. And I just think in, in this regard, uh, for the sake of our country, we need to do this because our politics has deteriorated to a very low point. Uh, and it's one of the things that really keeps me up at night because throughout the world, I think we've seen how, 
how this deterioration, social decay can end, and it never ends in a good place. So look, the truth is that the system set up by our founding fathers is not meant to act fast. Uh, Paul Ryan had a great line the other day. He said, uh, I run a coalition government without the efficiencies of a parliamentary system for a comparative politics class, but that's what we have, and we have two chambers. It's huge board of directors split in half, 435 and 100. It's difficult, and a lot of this work has to be done one by one, and that's how I work with my colleagues, one by one. I sit with them and I say, look, this is what's happening. This is the group we formed. This is the purpose of it. Uh, there are no surprises here. We're going to try to do everything by consensus. We want you to bring your ideas. And, and that's how we've gotten from zero to 62. And we just got to keep, uh, keep climbing. I felt the same way this summer. I mean, ev everything was, like, there was like a two week period where it was like hurricane, earth earthquake, not caused by climate change, but wildfire. It was just an onslaught, I'm sure you all remember. And, and here I am, day to day, working on climate change and feeling incredibly ineffective. So I just want to acknowledge that that's real. Um, but I think Portland, you know this, but other people may not know this, Portland was the first city in the country to pass a moratorium on any new fossil fuel infrastructure. And it was the first of its kind, and it was overturned a few months ago. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's going to stay permanent. And Massachusetts has a plan in front of Governor Baker to put the same thing in place for the state of Massachusetts, which would be good pressure on Governor Jerry Brown as well, and other progressive climate governors who want to do the right thing on renewable energy, but aren't quite ready to tackle the fossil fuel industry. So I think that those kinds of plans that are originating in the Northwest need to be copied in other parts of the country. And that's part of how we make these changes, is we have good template legislation. And people in other cities and towns don't have to make it up themselves. So I would say, uh, where you are, keep doing the kind of activism that's happening in the Northwest, but connect more dots in other parts of the country about what you did and how you did it, so they can do it too. OK, and then we have. Hi, my name is John Rumpler. I'm Clean Water Program Director for Environment America, as well as Environment Florida, our state affiliate. Um, and uh, while we absolutely are committed to addressing the, the climate crisis head on and moving to 100% renewable energy, uh, my colleague Rob Sargent, right in the audience here, heading that effort, um, I do think I was really struck, Congressman, by your remark about the local impacts of climate change many of those impacts, in fact, relate to water. When we think about hurricanes, we're talking about water. We're talking about people's floods. Uh, we're talking about toxic chemicals in Houston. We're talking about the exacerbation of algal blooms in South Florida, which were running through rivers near your district that were called guacamole. Wow. My question is, can we also reach a bipartisan consensus to grapple with these clean water issues to ensure that we have safe drinking water in communities that are free from flooding and toxic waste. Definitely, and in this case, I think Florida is a wonderful model for bipartisanship. Uh, I'm sure everyone here knows we have one of the great uh, worldwide treasures, which is the Everglades, and it's not just great because it's a wonderful ecosystem with fascinating biodiversity, but it's also where our drinking water is, mm. and uh, therefore, every Florida member, from the most conservative to the most liberal, uh, when it's time to come in and advocate for the Everglades and fight for Everglades restoration dollars and get new projects approved by the Army Corps of Engineers and the Water Resources Development Act, everyone is all in. So I think Florida, in that sense, now we need to get a lot of our Florida colleagues on the rest of the agenda, but when it comes to clean water and Everglades restoration specifically, there's unanimous support. And that is the kind of model that we can apply to the rest of the problem, but we need to find that local hook. No one wants to drink dirty water. Uh, so that really helps. And these are the types of opportunities we need to seek. A lot of our fellow citizens aren't going to understand the urgency of this unless they see it. 
Uh, and, and for us Catholics who know Thomas, we, you know, we know this, is, uh, this happens. People need to see to believe, and we need to help them see instead of uh, trying to shame them or lecturing them or alarming them. And, and you made a point earlier. I, I think we need to convey a sense of urgency, but in a genuine, constructive way. Uh, I think if we push a little too hard, we, we lose people. And my goal is to add. I think we can only do better if we add. Uh, if we get, if people shut us down or shut us off, we're, we're kind of done with them. So uh, I've been trying to find uh, that sweet spot, but I think I'm, I'm glad you raised the water issue because for those of you who aren't familiar with the political dynamic in Florida with regards to the Everglades, it's, it's really uh, something that, that gives us a lot of hope for the future. Yeah, thank you for your work. I agree. Um, and I think one of the most incredible climate activist movement building moments of the past decade was at Standing Rock, where the message was uh, from water protectors, water is life. And that's become more and more of a rallying cry globally. So I, I think more and more people are seeing this as the critical way to talk about climate change, but much more than that as well. So. Excellent way to end our session this evening. So um, I want to thank our, our honorees, uh, Congressman May, uh, your terrific work. I hope that this is uh, just the beginning of what we get to see, uh, what you're going to change on this planet. Um, Jack, uh, your committee for putting this together, uh, Steve, the hard work, Bill, for for hurting the cats here at the Institute of Politics. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, you do a great job. And you folks for coming, because if you weren't here, this would not have mattered at all. So thank you all. Thank you. So.